based on democracy, justice, and human rights, and that won't be coming from political parties that are funded by predatory banks, fossil fuel giants, and war profiteers. We're told we're in a recovery, but in fact, for most Americans and most people around the world even, this is an emergency. We're losing good jobs, wages are declining, health care and housing costs are skyrocketing, an entire generation of young people is trapped in predatory student debt that they basically can't pay in the current economy, black lives are on the firing line, immigrants are facing deportation, and we have these massive wars for oil for the past 14 years that are blowing back at us now with failed states, with growing terrorist threats, and with mass refugee migrations, and the climate is in a meltdown that threatens the very fabric of our civilization within our lifetimes. Meanwhile, the wealthy few are richer than ever, and the political establishment is actually making it worse with their policies of austerity and squandering trillions of dollars on wars, Wall Street bailouts, tax breaks for the wealthy. So the American people are in revolt. We know from polls that uh, Democrats and Republicans are now rather small portions of the electorate, 29 and 21 percent respectively, according to the latest Wall Street Journal poll. 50 percent of Americans have basically rejected those two parties, which are running now uh, majority unfavorable views by the American uh, public. So people are really clamoring for something very different, uh, and we are lifting that up and offering that. Uh, specifically, we are calling for a Green New Deal to create 20 million jobs on an emergency basis, uh, jobs that will green our energy, our food, and our transportation, and restore ecosystems uh, at the same time uh, that this Green New Deal revives the economy. It also turns the tide on climate change because we're calling for 100% clean renewable energy by 2030. Uh, and it also makes wars for oil obsolete. And I'll just mention, in addition, it pays for itself. The energy transition pays for itself simply in health savings from um, uh, basically money saved from preventing the spectrum of diseases uh, associated with fossil fuels. So this is a win-win. We're also calling uh, as a major priority for canceling student debt, bailing out the students like we bailed out the banks, uh, the students deserve relief from the uh, consequences of the waste, fraud, and abuse on Wall Street, for which Wall Street got a $16 trillion bailout and counting. So it's about time to bail out our young people and bring them back into the fabric of society. Eighty percent of young people stayed home in 2014. We intend to give young people a reason to come out and vote. And um, I'll mention we call for health care as a human right, for free public higher education, for reviving our schools, stopping this uh, regimen of uh, test, punish, and privatize that's been led by the uh, Democratic White House uh, and by uh, Democratic uh, partisans across the country. Um, we call for a, uh, a national action plan for racial justice now and for uh, basically calling a halt to police violence and racism with police review boards, with uh, standing investigators, so that all deaths at the hands of uh, police or in police custody are investigated as a matter of routine. Um, and we're calling for a halt to the immigrant deportations and detentions, which essentially criminalize the refugees from misguided U.S. policies, including NAFTA, which has destroyed economies, south of the border, uh, the war on drugs, which has killed 100,000 people in Mexico alone, and people are fleeing violence from the drug wars, which is very much a U.S. policy all over uh, Latin America, uh, and from the military and political illegal interventions, including uh, coups and invasions um, in Latin America in particular. But this is sort of a prototype that's also going on. Uh, in the Middle East. And I'll uh, just end by saying we also call for a foreign policy based on international law, human rights, and diplomacy. And uh, specifically, you know, um, what is the answer to ISIS? Let me just say 
up front that the answer to ISIS is not doing more of what created ISIS. ISIS is part of the blowback from a failed uh, foreign policy of total economic and military domination that has created five failed states, that has um, uh, basically made terrorist threats far worse and created ISIS, in fact, which is widely acknowledged, and created mass refugee migrations. So we need a foreign policy based on international law and human rights. We need a weapons embargo to the Middle East instead of arming and funding um, either on behalf of the U.S. or our allies, in particular the Saudis and the Qataris, uh, who are arming and funding uh, good terrorists and good warlords. We basically need a weapons embargo um, and uh, we need to halt the funding, even if that means seizing the bank accounts of our allies who have been funding terrorist forces for the last decade and more. So uh, these are critical problems that everyday Americans are being, uh, you know, really thrown under the bus over. Six trillion dollars spent on these wars for oil over the last uh, decade and a half. Six trillion, which comes out to seventy-five thousand dollars per household. So there are ways to move forward that doesn't dig us in deeper, that are based on principles of democracy and justice applied here in this country and applied around the world. These are solvable problems, and I'll just mention finally that um, as an independent third party, you know, it's important to recognize. Independents are no longer the minority. We're basically half of American voters now that have rejected the Democratic and Republican parties that have thrown them under the bus. Um, and the positions that we're lifting up are supported by majorities in poll after poll. So the name of the game is getting the word out. If young people alone who are in debt learn that they have a way to cancel debt by coming out and voting green in 2016 because we're the only campaign and the only party that will cancel student debt, uh, if those 43 million young people come out to liberate themselves from debt, that alone is a plurality of the vote. It's enough to win the election. So when young people learn that there's a way for them not only to participate and be respected, but to actually take control of their future and be the dominating force uh, in the election, we could see things turn in a really remarkable way. Um, so we're saying uh, it's time to stand up with a politics of courage not a politics of fear, because that fear has delivered everything we were afraid of. All the reasons people were given to uh, silence yourself and vote for the lesser evil, because you didn't want more Wall Street bailouts, you didn't want our jobs going overseas, you didn't want the attack on our civil liberties, on the freedom of the press, uh, you didn't want the um, offshoring of our jobs, these corporate trade deals, the uh, increase of this massive and unending war on terror. Uh, all those things we've gotten by the droves because we as a public interest force allowed ourselves to be silenced with this lesser evilism. So we say forget the lesser evil, it's time to stand up and fight for the greater good like our lives depend on it because they do. We can have a world that puts people, planet, and peace over profit uh, that world is not in our hopes, it's not in our dreams, it's right here and now in our hands. Thank you. With that, I'll just open it up. Hey, Jill. Um, locally, uh, we just had a really beloved progressive talk radio host announce that he was quitting his show mm -hmm. because he's in a feud with another beloved mm -hmm. talk radio host. And what he cited was um, the acrimony between Democrats supporting Sanders and Democrats supporting um, Hillary Clinton. And um, can you speak to this, this phenomenon of, of like I'm, I'm saying, acrimony mm -hmm. within a party mm -hmm. to choose a presidential candidate? I think there's a lot of acrimony out there in general these days. Um, so just a, a word about that first and then about inside the Democratic Party. You know, I think um, people are um, walking around kind of uh, tiptoeing on a minefield right now, not knowing which one's going to explode next. And I think there's just general um, anxiety, fear, and there's a real lack of trust because who do you trust out there? You know, we've been betrayed by 
uh, by so many of our institutions, uh, government, so much of the press has been corporatized. Um, you know, the Supreme Court is certainly in the pocket. As money and power have concentrated in the hands of very few, you know, all the institutions that used to support our sense of democracy and community are really um, crumbling before our eyes. And this, to me, is why we really need transformative change. And we, that change needs to be really based on our moral compass, on our deeply held uh, beliefs of democracy, justice, and human rights. We don't have that in our conventional political parties right now, so there's incredible infighting and bitterness within them. Uh, you know, and specifically within the Democratic Party, I think people are very afraid uh, of being betrayed, and perhaps the bigger trend is that people are leaving the Democratic Party. Um, according to polls, people are fleeing the Democratic Party because they don't trust what's going on there. And I think you, we're seeing that, uh, that kind of uh, social chaos inside the Democratic Party as well. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't surprise me because the Democratic Party uh, does not have, it's not known for its moral compass, you know. And so much hope and, um, hope and faith in change was put into the last election and the one before that, and people's hopes were dashed. So I think there's a lot of anxiety within the Democratic Party right now. And, you know, I sort of, um, I feel like these days what we do as an independent, people-powered party is we act as political therapists and we say there is a way forward, you know, that's based on principles that um, really reflect our deeply held values rather than compromising, you know, with a party that's funded ultimately by some of the biggest political predators out there. And I mean, you know, corporate predators. So it's very unfortunate and I hope people in their dismay over the Democratic Party will consider their options outside of politics as usual. And I hope they don't quit, quit their, uh, their, their jobs uh, in progressive media because we don't have many voices and we badly need them. Will the Green Party be on enough states to, to have you win the election or whoever is the Green Party nominee? We are fighting that battle right now and we're actually ahead of where we were four years ago. Four years ago, we achieved ballot status for about 82% of voters across the nation. Uh, at this stage of the game, we are on the ballot for most of the uh, highly populated states, and we're fighting uh, for the rest, and we are ahead of our schedule compared to um, uh, 2012. Uh, and we've just now achieved matching funds, which is a big milestone, and it's historic for an independent third party. Uh, to qualify this early. So we'll be using our funding because voters, you know, not only have a right to vote, which we have to vigorously defend, but voters also have a right to have more voices and more choices and not be locked inside of the box with these two parties that have thrown everyday Americans under the bus. If you're elected president, you'll theoretically run the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And as you know right now in Southern Oregon, there's a, um, mm -hmm. a situation where um, um, I'm going to say armed racist militants have occupied a federal facility. Um, they've committed crimes. They um, have declared that their goal is to overthrow the federal government. Um, what would you do if you're president? Yeah, you know, you make a really good point. If these people had dark skin color, you know, uh, there would be no hesitation about, you know, doing whatever it took to take back the facility, you know, and if they were of Islamic faith, you know, they would be in peril for their, you know, for the next breath that they took. So, you know, I think we need to stand firm using uh, peaceful means if possible, and whether that means shutting down their electricity, their water, you know, their... Uh, their their sanitation, etc. They're doing using all peaceful means to move them out and to address this broader issue, you know, of what's going on with these ranchers. And and let me say there um, that I have a a um, a note of sympathy for people who are facing economic distress, and we're seeing that across. Uh, working people and across middle class, we're seeing rising death rates with depression and with uh, hopelessness. Uh, and you know, this is sort of where fascism comes from. Fascism comes from 
uh, you know, people who have nowhere else to turn. So I think it's really important also to address the basic underlying uh, driving issues. And I know that cattle ranchers um, are facing drought. You know, they're they're facing uh, some very difficult economic issues. But we need to have a real discussion about that. And furthermore, you know, this is where our basic uh, policy comes in. People need to be assured that they are going to have jobs. They're going to have jobs with living wages, and they have an assured economic future. So we need to pull the rug out from under these proto-fascist movements, which are springing up all over the place. Speaking of jobs, there's a movement to raise the uh, minimum wage to $15 an hour. Local businesses are opposed to that. Do you think something like that would work or would be counterintuitive? You know, if the uh, minimum wage were adjusted for where it were in the 1960s, it would be well above $15 an hour. And if it were adjusted for the increasing productivity of workers, it would be, you know, in the 20-somethings, $22 an hour. So, you know, I think we have kind of made this deal with the devil, essentially. We have supported uh, massive profits for the wealthy few, but we've told working people that they're not entitled, you know, that that's entitled. Um, there are indeed stresses on small uh, ma and pa businesses, and we need to get them the supports that they need as well. Small businesses are in very bad shape. We need to be sure that they're not burdened with the cost of health care, which again should be paid for proportionately by those who afford it in a Medicare for All system uh, that ensures everyone is covered uh, in an efficient way. Um, we need to ensure that small businesses have access to loans. Uh, and the credit that they need, which they don't currently. You know, so there are ways that we can support small businesses, but working people should not be uh, the sacrificial lambs here. And, and let me say that the, uh, you know, the living wage needs to be nationalized, and it should be a, a federal standard. Any considerations of running mates? Last time you ran with... Um, Sherry Huntala. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, not yet. Um, you know, there's, uh, what shall I say, there are many interested um, communities that would like to be more visible, seen and heard, you know, and the purpose of our campaign, or one of its purposes, is to lift up the voices of disenfranchised communities, of frontline communities, to make frontline struggles the front lines of presidential dialogue. So we're particularly looking at frontline communities and, and uh, people who speak for them. I know there's other folks seeking the nomination. Do you have much contact with them? Is it a collaborative effort? Does it feel, com you know, I think Greens are much more about collaboration than necessarily competition. Is it a competitive thing? But are you in communication with those folks or coordinating in any way? Um, we have coordinated on a couple of joint appearances with the party. Um, for the most part, uh, you know, we are very focused on getting our message out yeah. beyond sort of the inner circle. Um, the other uh, campaigns are, um, shall we say, you know, uh, more on the exploratory phase and not actually. Um, you know, on the road, not talking to voters more broadly, which is where our focus is right now. Thank you. Do you have plans to come back to Oregon again? What's that? Do you have plans to come back to Oregon again? Uh, we certainly hope so. And let me just say about Oregon, you know, it has been so refreshing to see the, uh, the, the triumph over fossil fuels going on in Portland with so many facilities having been stopped before they poison the water and the air and the people. Um, this, uh, you know, this propane facility that was going to be built uh, in the harbor, I guess. Um, you know, these bring very real and present dangers. It's very exciting how these struggles have unified uh, people in the communities where this stuff would be transported through, polluting it, putting it at danger for explosion and for coal dust and so on. And what's really exciting is seeing that, that the Portland City Council actually came out, thanks to the leadership of the grassroots uh, community, that the, uh, that the City Council took a stand uh, opposing any further fuel, fossil fuel infrastructure. And that is likewise a plan that we have called for at the national level. We do have an emergency. When Pearl Harbor was bombed, 
after the Second World War. It took us six months to convert the economy to 25% of GDP within six months. It's absolutely astounding. 25% of GDP was converted to a wartime footing to deal with the national emergency. What we have in front of us now is a national emergency that makes the um, makes uh, Pearl Harbor look like, like peanuts because we're looking within decades, according to the latest science, we're looking at the potential for the breakup of the Greenland ice sheet and potentially the West Antarctic ice sheet as well, which would uh, profoundly raise sea level by 10, 20, even more uh, feet in a tsunami-like effect. You're not talking about gradual rise. This is as an ice sheet breaks up and tumbles into the ocean, you see a massive rise in sea level. So we're talking about not wiping out one harbor. We're talking about wiping out all harbors all around the world at the same time. And these are major population centers which are living on the coast around the world. So this is not um, something we are going to survive. We need to declare a national emergency right now while we can solve it, especially when we have a solution that not only solves the climate crisis, it actually improves our economy. It creates a sustainable, just, living wage, green economy that we uh, is within our reach right now. So, um, you know, we're saying we can do this, we need to get the word out, we need to mobilize. In many ways, this is sort of a Hail Mary moment right now. On the climate, you could say on the economy as well, which is, again, teetering on the brink, perhaps an even bigger brink than, than the last crash of 2008. The banks are only bigger and uh, equally uh, leveraged, shall we say, and equally invested in reckless gambling that taxpayers and uh, savers actually are now on the line for because now not only do they have bailouts, now they have a thing called the bail-in, which is basically where when the bank goes bankrupt, uh, they can confiscate the savings that are either stored in the bank or the money that's moving through them overnight through the pension funds and, and municipal uh, savings and things like that. So there are all kinds of ways that the economy is seriously at risk now because it is still being manhandled by uh, predatory banks and the like. You know, we need a democracy revolution. We need it right now. That ho won't happen with one person. It really requires uh, a coalition of us, a coalition for justice, uh, for human rights, for democracy, a coalition that coheres over time, space, issues, and generations. By definition, that is a political party. We need a new political party which is not held hostage by the economic and political elite that are driving us uh, over the cliff right now. So. We're saying it's time to stand up with politics of courage. The most dangerous thing you can do right now is to continue to vote for uh, what has been absolutely uh, put us on a lethal trajectory. We need to stand up and assert the power of our democracy. And by getting ourselves into the debate, by um, being covered, by uh, using social media, we can get the word out now to the demographics who, so, who self-organize, like young people in debt, that's a self-organizing demographic. Nobody's better positioned to get the word out. And getting that word out to young people alone, that they can be liberated from their debt and be assured of not only having health care as a human right, but um, access to higher education for free uh, and having jobs through a Green New Deal and the guarantee of a living wage job. Young people who realize that they have the power to actually make this happen by coming out and taking over the, uh, the election, that could actually be the thing that sets us apart. And whether we win the White House or whether we simply get enough votes to win the day and change the agenda, we can propel these real solutions forward and build the momentum for that political revolution, which cannot stop at the primary and it cannot stop after the election. Whether we win uh, the office or we win the day, this fight will go on, and it will go on in a party that supports this agenda. It will not be folded into a campaign uh, that is inherently opposed or into a political party that is fundamentally at war with an agenda for people, planet, and peace over profit. Together, we're unstoppable, and we're going to make it happen. Mm. Thank you.